My name is Sam Bachnin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. As the crisis in Italy is threatening to spread to France, Austria, Belgium, and other solid citizens of the Eurozone, pundits have hitherto ignored the greatest threat, Germany. With its economy stagnant, 0.5% projected GDP growth this year, Germany has assumed hundreds of billions of euros in new commitments to the faltering euro project. Normally, in times of crisis, investors would snatch up German bunds, government bonds, driving up their prices and driving down their yields. This time around, in the last few months, yields on Germany's much vaunted bunds remained more or less stable. This proves that investors are shying away, terrified, that the toxic waste generated by the likes of Greece and Italy will drag down mighty Germany. This time around, Germany cannot extricate itself via an increase in exports. It is in the same predicament as China and Japan, with exports slowing across the board. In an article I published in 1997 titled The History of Previous European Currency Unions, I identified five paramount lessons from the short and brutish life of previous, now invariably defunct, monetary unions, especially in Europe. I quote, A. To prevail, a monetary union must be founded by one or two economically dominant countries, economic locomotives. Such driving forces must be geopolitically important, maintain political solidarity with other members, be willing to exercise their clout and be economically involved in, or even dependent on, the economies of the other members. B. Central institutions must be set up to monitor and enforce monetary, fiscal and other economic policies, to coordinate activities of the member states, to implement political and technical decisions, to control the money, money aggregates and seigneurage, in other words, rents accruing due to money printing, to determine the legal tender and rules governing the issuance of money. C. It is better if a monetary union is preceded by a political one. Consider the examples of the United States, the USSR, UK, and Germany itself. D. Wages, wage and price flexibility are sine qua non. Their absence is a threat to the continued existence of any union. Unilateral transfers from rich areas to poor ones are a partial and short-lived remedy. Transfers also call for a clear and consistent fiscal policy regarding taxation and expenditures. Problems like unemployment and collapses in demand often plague rigid monetary unions. The works of Mandel and McKinnon about optimal currency areas proves it decisively and separately. E. Clear convergence criteria and monetary convergence targets for all the countries involved in the project are essential. Convergence in, the, in this sense means the alignment of economic policies and statistics until the members become indistinguishable. Germany and Greece, France and Spain should all have, the, should, should all have had the same economic profile at the beginning of the process of monetary union. Well, they didn't, and of course they still don't. End of quote. The current European Monetary Union is far from heeding the lessons of its ill-fated predecessors. Europe's labor and capital markets, though recently marginally liberalized, are still more rigid than 150 years ago. The euro was not preceded by an ever closer political or constitutional union. It relies too heavily on fiscal redistribution without the benefit of either a coherent monetary or a consistent fiscal area-wide policy. The euro is not built to cope, either with asymmetrical economic shocks affecting only some members but not others, or with the vicissitudes of the business cycle. This does not bode well. The union might well become yet another footnote in the annals of economic history.